Okay, we are live on YouTube, we are live on Locals, and we just went live on Rumble. How many more platforms are there? Well, I haven't sent it to Twitter yet. I thought about it. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, think- may- maybe we should do an episode there to get the word out. I don't know. What about that Twitter Spaces place? Is that a place? to? Uh, that's where you just have a meetup. Right. right. That's where we do a call in and, and meet up on there. <laughs> and, and I thought about doing that. We probably should consider doing it. Um, just haven't put it together yet. I saw that our friend Viva Fry was on a Twitter Spaces earlier today. He was. I yeah, heard. He, so, so. I heard they're doing. Uh, him and Barnes are doing as a as a duo. Alex Jones on Thursday for a number of hours. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I heard that mentioned somewhere. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, good times. Good times. So, okay. So to today, everybody thought they're going to slip away. And we're going to forget about the commie spies, but we haven't. No, the, where did we leave off with the commie? It's been a couple of weeks. Where did we leave off? Do you remember it all? Or? Well, essentially, the Rosenbergs are dead. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the Rosenbergs are dead. And this was the last uh, piece of the puzzle that we put together, yep. right? The Jello thing yep. that, they, that they denied for decades. I watched some HBO documentary. It was about the... Um, the granddaughter of the Rosenbergs, um, uh, the daughter of one of the Mirpoles, and uh, she was looking into um, the fact that her grandparents were completely innocent. And holy crap, I, I, this was some fantasy, of course, HBO. She interviews a bunch, she hooks up with another girl, and the two of them go to the courtroom where they had the trial. They start crying. They were innocent. I mean, this is from this a year old, this documentary. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I sent away for it, got the DVD, and, I, dude, I couldn't even make it through. It was such incredible uh, commie horse shit that I was I, – I couldn't believe that after everything we've been through with the Venona cables and uh, uh, the notebooks, you know um, – how do they address that? They just say it was a lie. It was just made up. Absolutely, what? everything was a lie. Everything was a lie. I'm the granddaughter. I know she goes and interviews Morton Sobel in a housing project that one of the co-defendants on the case did 20 years. He says uh, I was completely innocent. Uh, I didn't rat anybody out. I'm still good. Uh, complete commie. Never buckled. Uh, absolutely astounded. Laughing hysterically that he did not get executed. That he got Hilarious. away with it. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> laughing in his government housing uh, apartment. Well, so he's living as close to the uh, communist ideal as he can. Not as close as these two guys we're going to cover today. <laughs> <laughs> because this K, I'm sorry, I got a little Kasha Vanishkish in my throat for my uh, Happy New Year Jewish friends at home. They can explain to Eric what Kasha Vanishkish is and if you have it the second or third day, it gets a little dry. You know what I mean? So <coughs> I have a little bit stuck in my throat. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today, if we can, is this is a rambling thing. This may need a third or fourth part, Eric. That's why I'm mentioning this. This may not be completed today, Eric. Yeah, no, I think this is going to be a series because. Yeah, um, it's got to be a the, Kami series. Yeah. The, well, the Venona papers themselves, I feel, might warrant an episode. The beauty of this entire thing is the lying for 40, what was it, from the 1950 to 1996. No, 70 ish. years. <laughs> I, I, it's just astounding. And how they're completely eradicated, uh, truth wise, by the Venona uh, cables and papers. Uh, and yet they still don't stop. You could go on Wikipedia today and they just go, the supposed Venona. I mean, they will never, ever stop lying. And what this case is about that we're going to get into today is about a man named Alger Hiss, who is one of the biggest liars in American history. And I mean a liar. He gets sent to jail for lying. Um, But the lies are 10 times bigger than the two that he got sent to jail for. So we're, we're going to get to that in a little while. But I just wanted to cover first the election of 1948 with Truman. 
because uh, Truman's president during this thing. In the 1948 election, Truman versus Dewey, and, and you're gonna, the reason I'm mentioning this whole series is because of the echoes it has for today, including the fact that Truman is Joe Biden. Truman is this cantankerous, corrupt, old school machine Democrat who I believe stole the 1948 election. The 1948 election, if you look at the numbers on it, um, by the way, there's also a 1948 election with Box 13 down in Texas by another guy that we've covered who stole that election, uh, Eric. Mm. And uh, yeah, the same year. But 1948, uh, 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 Dewey is running against Truman. Dewey's from New York. He is a kind of a liberal Republican and uh, or moderate Republican versus uh, uh, a corrupt machine Democrat who was, like Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States beforehand. There's so many similarities to this thing. And he is a mean, nasty uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's stuff about uh, uh, Truman. We'll do an episode just on Truman. But keep in mind, there's a guy named Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was the VP. Henry Wallace begins to run in the 1948 election against Truman by forming the Progressive Party, just like Cornell West. Henry Wallace has the same politics in 1948 that Cornell West has today. Okay. Now, on that note, wasn't um, wasn't Wallace removed from the ticket by the Democratic machine when Truman mm -hmm. and was slid in as VP? <clears throat> I don't want to get into it because we're going to do a whole Wallace episode. Because okay. cool. Wallace is the communist that they wanted to have become secretly president of the United States and take over the entire country. And we're going to okay. do an episode on that, and I'm going to prove it to people. About Henry Wallace. But let me just back up for a second, because Strom Thurmond runs as a Dixiecrat, uh, also on the in the Democratic lane. And the three of them are running uh, together against Dewey, uh, who's over on the Republican side of the aisle as the as a moderate governor of, uh, of New York. Now, the Dixiecrats uh, with Strom Thurmond, what is their goal? Their goal is to get it into the House of Representatives. Why? So they can extract concessions from Truman for Southern civil rights and things that they don't want to happen. So they want to prevent prevent both, uh, um, you know, uh, Dewey and Truman from having a majority. And both of them end up under 40 percent. They And I think uh, Strom Thurmond takes about four states. Now, both uh, 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 Wallace and Strom Thurmond take a little under 3% apiece uh, of the popular vote. Uh, so it's almost like 5.8% uh, combined, right? Uh, okay. Three and three, six, a little bit later, 5.7%. Good chunk of votes. Now, the reason this is important, and, and I'll tell you why, the the race, you know, if you have the, the headline, which we've seen, Eric, if you could put that up there, um, you know, Dewey defeats Truman, right? The famous Chicago uh, uh, newspaper. Well, it turns out, that uh, uh, less than 1% of the vote, I don't know where Eric went. Oh, oh, he's back. Okay. It turns out that less than 1% of the vote between Dewey and Truman in Ohio, in Illinois, and California, Eric, this race was so close. Now, he wins the, the, the Electoral College, Truman, 303 to 189 to 39. Uh, the 39 split up among those cats. Uh, uh, but the reality of it is, when everybody went to bed, Dewey was leading by a landslide. Dewey was ahead in the polls for weeks. Do, uh, Truman had the approval rating exactly the same as a guy named Joe Biden. He had the lowest approval rating of any Democratic president in years, in decades. Yep. Uh, and then he maintained that. I think McCullough's book has helped revitalize his reputation of recent years. Well, and McCullough is a questionable historian anyway. But the point I'm trying to make is there's so many similarities to today. And Truman, when, when they win this election in 1948, they take back the House and the Senate. And this kind of puts a kibosh on because in 46, the Republicans had the House and Senate. And this throws the uh, uh, investigations that we're going to get into, the anti-communist stuff, 
into a, a downward spiral because just like today, Truman will not allow the Justice Department to go after any of the commies. Is this? I mean, there's so many. I, I, dude, I've been working on this thing for weeks. There's so many freaking similarities to what's going on today that they know this. They, the ones who are doing this today know this history inside and out. It's the people on the right who don't know this at all. They have been. What's that? I was going to say it gets worse. Um, as of today. <clears throat> The Biden administration has appointed James Clapper, John Brennan, and Paul Colby to a new DHS Homeland Intelligence. Right. We'll, we'll get into year. that. We'll get into this on Friday. But let me yeah. let me just stick in 1948 for a second, because the Democrats take back both houses, and this puts a damper on the House of Sa House and American Activities Committee, which is being led by which is the Dyes Committee, originally Congressman Dyes out of Texas, and one of the stars on that committee is Richard Nixon, who's a congressman from California. So Nixon has latched on to this guy Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss. He 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 there's two guys. Let me just let me just get to where this is before I I just wanted to give you the thing about Cornell Wells West and Henry Wallace uh, hmm. and also the Democratic election being stolen by Lyndon Baines Johnson down in Texas and in, in the famous Box 13 incident uh, where he waited for the count to be done and then trumped it with a couple of extra votes at a Box 13. Uh, and, and, and Texas. So the reality of it is there's so many similarities today uh, that, you know, which is the interest to me in, in doing this series. It's not just a historical trip down memory lane for the sake of doing it. Whitaker Chambers in 1938 was a communist. He was a communist. And when I say communist, let me just set this up because it's a little confusing for a lot of people. Whitaker Chambers in the book Witness, which is the book of the week, by the way, I highly recommend you read this 750-page book by Whitaker Chambers, not because it's his autobiography. It's because it's been voted one of the 25 greatest books ever written. Uh, Whitaker Chambers is a brilliant writer, not just a guy who had a, an incredibly unusual life. He is a great creative writer, comes from a poor family uh, uh, in Philadelphia. They moved to Limbrook, Long Island. He goes to Columbia University on a scholarship. He becomes a head of the newspaper there. He gets influenced by communists at Columbia. Keep in mind, this is 1929, the Great Depression. Things are falling apart left and right. And, and commies uh, were trying to seize the day and trying to do something uh, with the disaster that is crumbling all around them, Eric, as you can imagine. I mean, their, their peak was when the Depression happened. And, and one, of the, um, one of the multiple programs that was started in the in the new deal and we'll get into this was a thing called um, the agricultural adjustment administration it was a triple a the triple a was part of the new deal and the triple a was infiltrated by soviet spies and these are not spies stealing anything this is this is why there's the revelation to me uh has occurred during the past couple of weeks they were not spying on us they were infiltrating departments of the government to change U.S. foreign policy and domestic policy. Spying was of, of minor importance to them compared to this. And, and yet that's where McCarthy comes from, saying the State Department has been infiltrated, the Department of Defense has been infiltrated. He is completely correct in all of his things. There were so many people that he, he literally couldn't show the list of names because it was so long, Eric. You know, when he's waving these lists, there's so many people that you, you you couldn't even put them on paper. That's how many communists have infiltrated this. And Whitaker Chambers is part of this. And Whitaker Chambers is running a KGB spying operation out of New York. And he has uh, people that he's recruiting, just like Julius Ro Rosenberg was recruiting. Julius Rosenberg recruited a guy named Russell McNutt. I don't know if we mentioned him last uh, the two weeks ago. There was a guy named Russell McNutt, and he was an engineer, an atomic, <coughs> an atomic spy who got away with it. And he ended up being a senior engineer for Gulf Oil and uh, moved to Reston, Virginia, where he, I think he's like 99 years old or something when he passed away. Uh, but this guy got away with it. He was part of the atomic spy group that nobody ever caught, recruited by, by a uh, true believer, uh, uh, Julius Rosenberg. So the reality of it is Whitaker Chambers 
all of these guys, and this is exactly the same for, for Alger Hiss, uh, and I'll get into the background. Whitaker Chambers came from an extremely dysfunctional middle class family. I mean, the mother was crazy. Uh, one of the brothers did self deletion, Eric. Uh, now I'm catching myself. There's a bunch of self deletions in, in this. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a bunch of self deletion attempts also. So uh, he, he has a religious conversion, uh, Whitaker Chambers, and believes all it, that communism is anti-man. He is an avowed communist. He has this, later on, this conversion. He becomes a Quaker, and he realizes he can't do nothing. He can't, with all the knowledge and information that Whitaker Chambers has of all the spies and infiltrators from the Soviet uh, uh, KGB, and I don't mean the KGB, but there are KGB Russians involved, sure. but also these American communists. One of the American communists is Alger Hiss, and Alger Hiss, I don't even know what I could say would be the equivalent of Alger Hiss today. It would be the, the equivalent of Henry Kissinger, okay? He is so embedded, he is so embedded, so revered, so involved in American policy that the idea that Alger Hiss was a communist was one of the most preposterous things you could ever say. It, it, this is a guy who came out of Baltimore, uh, also from poverty, also his brother self-deleted, Exactly. Excuse me. His sister self-deleted, uh, drinking a bottle of Drano. Both of these groups, both of these families, Whitaker Chambers. I don't know if you put up a picture of Chambers, but I did. Okay, Whitaker Chambers and Al Hiss are almost like doppelganger families, right? There, there's Chambers. They're almost like doppelgangers, and the reason they gravitated towards the Communist Party was because their nuclear family had been decimated by alcoholism, dysfunction, and everything else. They had no structure in their lives. When they went and became American communists, they had the structure and the fascism and the discipline that they needed in their personal lives. Chambers talks about this in different words. Uh, the book is the equivalent of Solzhenitsyn's uh, uh, Gulag Archipelago. I mean, it is a masterpiece of writing. Now you say, well, why could it be? Why is it a masterpiece of writing? It's because between 1939 and 1948, he Alger Hiss uh, uh, was pointing out that Whitaker Chambers was the senior editor of Time Magazine under Henry Luce. He literally wrote entire issues. I mean, stuff that is revered today. Uh, Ghosts on the Roof. I mean, stuff that he wrote, uh, Toynbee, reviews of, of James Joyce. He was Time Magazine under Henry Luce's administration. Now, people think Henry Luce, there's Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce. Uh, Claire Booth Luce famously being told by LBJ uh, that he liked the odds of a president uh, dying every 20 years on the, on the, um, <clears throat> during the inauguration of JFK. He told Claire Booth Luce that. I think he had an affair with Claire Booth Luce. I've never been able to confirm that, uh, so I'm not going to confirm that here today. But Henry Luce, uh, the guy on the right, owned Life magazine. He owned Time magazine. And he was not just a magazine. The, one of the reasons I love this story is I'm a magazine guy. And it gets into the weeds of how magazines are run at their peak in 1939, 1940, the war years. Time magazine, there was no television. You had to read Time magazine, Eric, every week. And who was the senior, senior editor behind the scenes? Henry Luce. So between Henry Luce and Whitaker Chambers, every week, these two guys, these savage editors, and I, I mean savage in a good way, literally edited it, the entire magazine in 18-hour staying awake all night episodes with him and Henry Luce. And Henry Luce has always been derided as this, you know, multimillionaire guy. He was covered with ink with Whitaker Chambers. Whitaker Chambers would write in almost entire issues. He started out in the back of the book, the back of the book for people who don't understand magazine. It's usually book and film reviews. It's not considered mm -hmm. uh, uh, to have any gravitas. Uh, uh, he started from the back of the book, worked his way to the front of the book where he became a senior editor. And in 19, I want to say 1940, Eric was making $30,000 a year. How much is that today? Uh, it, you know, at times 10? No, you it's say? a lot. I, I don't right. Know. Okay. Yeah. Is it 300 yeah. grand? I mean, Probably. 400 grand? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so what I'm trying to say is when Alger Hiss 
is accused of being a Soviet spy. Every single person in the country said, Al Jahiz? I mean, it was just crazy, right? So they began to attack Whitaker Chambers, the Al Jahiz followers. Now, why did they attack uh, 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 Whitaker Chambers? It's the same reason that LBJ is defended today. They made their bones on Al Jahiz. Al Jahiz wrote their job recommendations. Al Jahiz was at Yalta sitting next to FDR. Al Jahiz opened the United Nations. He wrote our, our uh, uh, a contract with the UN. Al Jahiz was working with the, the Roosevelt administration to divide up Europe after the war. He was at Yalta, for, for Christ's sakes. And he is so embedded in American foreign policy, but he starts at the AAA. And that's the point where I just wanted to tell you, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration was one of these obscure FDR programs under the New Deal. And the communists, just like I've talked to you and we've discussed how Marxists will get onto a school board, then they want to get into any position of power, not to stay there, but to gravitate up the ladder. So what they did, the commies that were in the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, they leaped into the State Department. They gravitated into the Department of Agriculture. They, do, they gravitated into the Treasury Department, where there was a guy, I want to tell you, Harry Dexter White, who was the Treasury uh, Assistant Director of the Treasury. Harry Dexter White was part of this commie group. What did he do? He went over and advised Lenin and, and St Stalin how to run their economic uh, uh, operation. He was writing papers for the Soviets on how to run their economy. This guy, White, he later... Uh... Okay, I just want to say something. There's a lot of self-delusions that weren't self-delusions. Um, there's a great quote that, 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 that he, is, he is told um, by a KGB operative any fool can commit a murder, but it takes an artist, Eric, to commit a good natural death. This was told, no, no, this was told by Chambers from a KGB wet uh, assassin who, by the way, they were stalking him in New York. Once he comes out, the, the KGB is dealing with these people, throwing him out of windows in New York, uh, having these phony self deletions, Eric, and they are playing for keeps. And they're, he's, he's sleeping with a revolver now, and he's got a wife and, 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 and a kid, and, in, and his mother lives there in Limbrook. He eventually moves to a farm in Maryland, uh, but he is being stalked by KGB operatives in the United States. And that is, you know, uh, we all know how they got Trotsky down in Mexico, but I always thought, yeah, it's Mexico. Anything could happen in Mexico. But it's New York City that they're doing this, for Christ's sakes. I mean, it really, really scared the crap out of me reading this stuff about how he was being hunted like an animal chambers. OK, so these guys infiltrate. Uh, Alger Hiss, 1936, worked under Cordell Hull, the famous secretary of state in the State Department. Uh, he has a British equivalent uh, for our British friends who will know this name named uh, Donald McLean, uh, 1944, 1949. Uh, he was the British Algerist, their Soviet spy. Obviously, we all know Kim Philby, uh, and we know Klaus Fuchs, the Adam spy. But they had also infiltrated uh, the British government to do the same thing. The spying was superfluous. It was about influencing and, and eventually taking over the country from within. Now, the Chinese are having a difficult time pulling this off. Of course, they kind of stand out. They go, hey, what's that Chinese guy doing over there, right? Like with Fang Fang, you know, with Eric Swalwell, they just stand out and then they flee back to China. A lot of these guys would flee back to the Soviet Union, but they looked like us. And a lot of these were Americans, Eric. They all spoke German. That German was the common communist language, by the way, because the Communist Party, the biggest communist party in Germany, outside of the Soviet, in, the, in Europe, outside of the Soviet Union was in Germany. The communists who were defeated by Hitler rise up afterwards. Obviously, we all know in East Germany with the Stasi and everything else, they that becomes the language of communism is German. Well, Marx was German, so that kind of makes sense. That father right, but that, that's like the 1800s, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, and they're just continuing the tradition down because there were a lot of communists here even before there was a Soviet Union. Uh, probably true in some regard. 19, you're talking about 1905 or something? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
But I mean, now it's just on, Eric, because we have mm. this we have this pact between the Stalin and Hitler. And, you know, people poo poo this. The people on the left said, you know, they were just buying time. Bullshit. These were two totalitarian regimes that were going to fight for domination of the world. They eventually turn on each other not too long after that. But Stalin ends up with what he wanted. Poland is the prize. Uh, the Russia, the Germans go into Poland. Uh, in fact, at Yalta, Roosevelt makes a feeble attempt to have democratic elections in Poland. And Stalin goes, yeah, I'll get on that right away, bro. <laughs> it's like, don't worry, I'll take care of that. But, you know, he said every move against the communists was felt by the liberals as an assault against themselves. And the communist, this is from, from Chambers, the communists knew that the liberals would block anyone that came after them by their own stupidity, their own naivete. They hated the liberals more than they hated conservatives. Let that sink in. They looked at conservatives as these people at least have values. The liberals were despised by both ends of the political spectrum. Both ends of the spectrum. They used these liberals for every single thing they could get their hands on. And when they came after them, they yelled that they were under attack, that it was a witch hunt, and the liberals came to their defense. The liberals looked at the communists as just exuberant liberals. What, what Chambers talks about is that the American people, A, had no idea this was going on, B, did not understand what communism was, and C, did not have any tools to fight back uh, if they did understand it, which is the equivalent of where we are today, which is why I wanted to do this. Because these people that Chambers runs into, nobody can help him. They all turn against him. They all go, well, dude, you're admitting you were a Soviet spy. The other guy says you're out of your mind. I mean, look at it. Look at it from the, the zeitgeist of the media that turns against Whitaker. Sure. Cha they turned against Whitaker Chambers because here's a guy who comes out and says, I was a Soviet spy. Okay, end of story. End of story. Now what do you want us to say? Well, I, I've changed and now I'm a Quaker. And they're going like, good luck with that, bro. So he realizes, Chambers, that he can't just go away and have a good life. That he has to out these people. And he does this reluctantly because he knows them. He's eaten with them. Their families have vacation sure. together. He knows the his family. They have children together. And the his family is not alone. There's other people that he outs. But he realizes he is going to have to do this alone as an American because he has too much information. He goes to the FBI in 1936, 1938, 1940. FBI is not interested. Why are they not interested? Because Hoover's hunting Nazis all through the United States. Not that they like commies. They're hunting Nazis. You know what I mean, Eric? So they don't have time for this uh, uh, Whitaker Chambers. Hey, look, I'm in a Soviet spy ring, by the way. They're, you know, they're going, well, you know, they're our allies. You know, they're our allies with an asterisk, Eric. Frenemies you know, almost. Right, right. Because everybody knows we are using them to defeat the Nazis and vice versa. Uh, all of this commie horse shit that we were allies and how could you not give them the A-bomb? Fuck you. The reality of it was we hated their guts and they were commie rats. And the people who were on the right in this country knew that. And that's why the A-bomb thing was so important, because the Korean War, which we discussed uh, in the previous episode, uh, hinges on them getting the A-bomb to have the muscular political strength to green light the northern invasion into South Korea. And that's been established pretty much as a fact at this time. And every American who died because of that fighting in the Korean War or came back damaged and shell-shocked have the American Communist Party to thank for that. Now, it's it's legal for a number of years. And, and, and Chambers talks about the fact that Everyone who's in the American Communist Party, every member, every member is a spy. They're not just in the party, Eric. He says mm. every freaking one of them is expected to be a spy and turn over documents, steal documents, do what you can to undermine. They had a communist gas station attendant, for Christ's sakes, who would help them with their vehicles. Oh, variety. Right. But every one of them. Now, there was a group called the Ware Group. Um, that was one of the guys who was run by this guy, Ware, um, who oversaw, they had cells, Eric, 
you know, different cells. Mm -hmm. And and these groups would would infiltrate the government and begin to get stuff out of the government. And what happened is he, uh, Alger Hiss, that is, sent stuff to Whitaker Chambers and he typed it up or his wife typed it up on a Woodstock, uh, what's the name of the company, typewriter. And that was one of the reasons they took him down. They took him down for two counts of perjury. The the first count of perjury was that he never met uh, Whitaker Chambers. This thing goes, uh, it, when there's in hearings, I don't know if you have any video of any of the hearings, but the hearings were watched <laughs> by 36 million Americans for the first time. The first hearings ever televised in the United States were the Alger Hiss Whitaker Chamber hearings. This was the biggest news story in American history. Because you have these top two people going toe to toe and the American media said one of them has to be lying. Oh, go ahead. See, let me see if you have a little bit here. That's, I think that's what uh, uh, Alger Hiss. Uh, Mr. Chambers, could you stand up? Uh, Mr. Hiss, have you ever seen this individual? Let me hear you. This individual who is standing. I have. Do you know him? I identify him specifically. As who? As George Crosby. When did you last see Mr. Crosby as you have identified him? Prefacing my answer with the same <laughs> remark I just made, I would think sometime in 1935. In 1935 was the last time that you saw him. According to my best recollection, not having checked the record. Now, will you remain standing a moment, Mr. Hiss? Mr. Chairman, would you swear in Mr. Chambers? <coughs> nothing but the truth to help you God. Oh, no. Mr. Chambers, Chambers, do you know the individual who is now standing at the witness stand? Who is he? When did you first meet Mr. Hiss? 1934. When did you last see Mr. Hiss? To me, as George Crosley came into my office in the Senate office building while I was acting as chief counsel to the Senate committee investigating the munitions industry. He represented himself as a freelance writer for magazines. <laughs> he represented himself as preparing a series of articles about the munitions investigation, as did many other members of the press, research people, similar people. He had a perfect right to come to my office either directly or through reference from the central office. <laughs> in the letter I sent to the chairman yesterday, I urged. I hope I will have a chance to read that letter into the record so it will be a part of the record. What did you say? You have a chance. Thank you. I certainly urge this committee not to follow any hit and run tactics to keep right after this issue of who is Chambers, of what credibility to give to his fantastic testimony. <laughs> I certainly do, and I intend to do the best I can to get to the bottom of this and to give this committee any information I can dig up. And I've asked my counsel so to do. Anyway, it's pretty much like that. The yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's rough, it's, but. Let me, he is, okay, so not only did he lie about no, not knowing Chambers, Everything that Alger Hiss says in these hearings and in his trial is a lie. And it comes from the theory that you might as well lie big, Eric, right? And, and boy, oh boy, does this guy lie big. And piece by piece, he gets caught in each lie, Hiss. And he he's, so, he's such a great lawyer. First of all, he interns with a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, of the Supreme Court. His benefactor is Felix Frankfurter, another Supreme Court judge. Uh, he brings them all in. You got to see the people he brings in as character references. He brings in uh, ex presidents, ex presidential candidates, uh, Supreme Court justices. That's him on the right, Alger Hiss, with the legendary Oliver Wendell Holmes. I mean, Alger Hiss is above reproach. 
And the reason the deep state and the government rallies around Al Jahiz is because he made them. And if he goes down, their careers are now affected, even if they're not communist, Eric, if they're just liberals. Every like like Truman, they, they take this before Truman even becomes president. They take this to FDR and FDR goes, ha, 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 communists in the government. Isn't that a, a laugh? His wife testifies on behalf of uh, of uh, Al Jahiz, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt. That's how big Al Jahiz is and revered and understood to be in this government. And the people who rally behind him are praying he's not a Soviet spy, but they have to go to the mat for him. Uh, Dean Acheson, the 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 great uh, uh, father figure of the of the of the State Department, defends him even after conviction, even after he's convicted of perjury in two counts and goes to jail, sentenced to five years in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania uh, penitentiary. In Lewisburg, what does he do in Lewisburg? He's going to get his ass shanked, right? The people in Lewisburg kill another Soviet spy a week before he gets in there, the inmates. They shank the shit out of this guy, and he was a Soviet spy. So what is, what is uh, I'm getting a little ahead in the story, but nevertheless, what, what Hiss does, 1950, is he sides up and he starts helping giving legal advice to a guy named Frank Costello, the leader of the mob in New York. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he's protected by Frank Costello in Lewisburg. And he does, you know, almost four years in Lewisburg, you know, which is a pretty good sentence. Uh, two trials. One is eight to four hung jury to convict. Uh, four of them won't buckle. So they try. Uh, they begin the trial right afterwards again with Tom Murphy. Tom Murphy is this incredible prosecutor uh, who just shreds his shreds his defense, shreds everyone. The two questions from the grand jury on December 15th, 1948, did you know Chambers after 1936? And he says no. And all of the stuff you're seeing is him moving the goalposts. I didn't know Chambers by that name. I Chambers had another name. I don't know. Dude, dude, it's so crazy how, and he's such a brilliant lawyer, Alger Hiss, that he's mincing words and you can't even tell he's mincing words. That's how smooth this cat was. He wore thousand dollar suits. He was he was above reproach. He was the greatest lawyer in the country and he was on trial for being a Soviet spy. If that ain't enough for a movie, I don't know what is. And of course, Hollywood bought up uh, Whitaker Chambers' book, Never Made the Movie, and everybody wanted that book, uh, Witness, and for some reason, uh, they just buried it, the deep state. So it never came out to be a movie. He becomes a Quaker. Uh, uh, this is getting back to Chambers again. He becomes a Quaker and becomes very spiritual, and, and there's another Quaker on that panel, and on that panel is Richard Nixon, who's a Quaker, and they bond. And this is Nixon looking at the microfilm that uh, Whitaker Chambers put into a pumpkin in his backyard. Now, you say, well, what's in that pumpkin? I don't know if you have a shot of the pumpkin, but there's a, a, a yeah. shot. It was all over the papers. Everywhere you looked was this pumpkin. They, they, the media was all over this. And <clears throat> Nixon looked at this microfilm. And in that microfilm were typed up documents. These were cables during the war, cables during the war, directly from the State and Defense Department that Alger Hiss had stolen and written up notes about to send to the Soviets. And in fact, they were sent to the Soviets. The Soviets knew all of our weaponry. They knew all our munitions. You say, well, how could that be? Well, it turns out they had a Senate committee to investigate the munitions industry. The munitions industry would be the equivalent today of the military industrial complex, right? I mean, just munitions, let's say. So the munitions industry was reaping uh, whirlwind profits during the war, so they had an investigation. Uh, Hiss becomes the legal counsel to the committee, 1934, Eric. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's who Alger Hiss is. Now, what does he learn in there? All the intelligence about our munitions. Who does he give them to? The Soviets. He types it up on this typewriter, this Woodstock typewriter, where the FBI finally gets off their fat ass and starts doing what the FBI does, matching the keystrokes of the typewriter to the written typewritten word on the paper because Alger Hiss's wife typed up his notes. And in that pumpkin, 
is the microfilm of the notes. And that's what Nixon is looking at. That's what makes Nixon a senator. That's what makes Nixon a, a two-term president, is that microfilm. Because he, Nixon, unlike everyone else, latched onto Alger Hiss, uh, uh, onto Whitaker Chambers, and never buckled. Well, he did buckle a couple of times. Because that film that's in there, they send it out to be investigated, the film. And it comes back that uh, Alger Hiss says this, uh, uh, Chambers says this film is from 1937 right? Mm -hmm. They send it out, the House Un-American Activities Committee, to uh, the experts in the film division, and they come back with a report that this film was not created as a film stock until 1945. So Nixon calls up Whitaker Chambers says, you lying sack of shit, you made a monkey out of me. And he goes, what? He says, this stock was not even invented until 1945. And Chambers says, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's, you know, the stuff I've had. It was stuff from 1936, 37. I put it in the pumpkin, you know, because I they, I figured they, they were going to raid my house. And um, I don't know what to tell you. So a day later, the experts come back to Nixon's office and they go, we made a mistake. Uh, the stock was made in 1934. Ooh. <laughs> right. So, so that was the only time he turned on Chambers. Now, Chambers is so reluctant to out these people, but he knows he has to do it for spiritual Christian reasons, for Quaker reasons, to save the United States. Is this any footage or is it just a photo? It's just a, a photo of him. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And this goes on for days and days and days. You know, Alger Hiss completely says, I've never met this guy. I don't know this guy. So Nixon starts digging into it. What do they learn? He lived in his house. He rented him his house for free. He lives in Al Hiss's house. He buys a car for $486. Who gives him the money? Al Hiss gives him $400. He denies this, Al Hiss. They then find his bank account, Al Hiss, where he withdraws $400 the day before. I mean, it's every single step of the way Alger Hiss lies after lie after lie after lie. And eventually they just go out, ah, F it. They ask him the two questions and they, the grand jury assembles and he's indicted for perjury. And that begins the beginning of the two trials. There's, there's Alger Hiss convicted in 1937. That, uh, what is that? Oh, it's his number, right. That's his yeah. uh, number. And there's Nixon, obviously, with the headlines of that happening. Uh, but Hiss fights this. To the day he dies. And now his son, Tony Hiss, also denies all of this. Uh, he, he lives until 1996, by the way. Uh, I think he's born in 1904. He, he, all of these guys live a million years. You know what I mean? They never die. But uh, one of the guys, and I don't know how to spin this, so I'm just going to tell you. There was one of the guys who was in his secret um, operation well this is this comes out from the venona cable so this might not be related to alger hiss one of the spies that was was a soviet spy was a major in the uh u.s army and he was turning over the names of other oss operatives and this comes out in the in the in the uh um uh, uh, Vasiliev notebooks, which is part of the Venona cables, which we'll get into in another episode. But one of the, the spies who was turning over names of the OSS to the Soviets was Arthur Goldberg, who would become a Supreme Court judge. Great. Love yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was a major at the time in the OSS. So we'll, we'll get into that. Bill Donovan was apparently a complete fool. Uh, he was duped by the KGB. Uh, they had different names for the KGB back then. GRU was the military version and the other one, NVK or whatever that was. But the reality of it is that these groups had infiltrated the Pentagon, the State Department, the Department of Agriculture. Every freaking department in the United States government was infiltrated. And that leads us up to, to uh, uh, McCarthy, to Senator McCarthy out of Wisconsin. That's where McCarthy begins to roll up his sleeves and say, this government is infiltrated, this Pentagon, this military and everything else. And what we're seeing is this never ending shift between these two forces. And, and Whitaker Chambers talks about this in his book. He talks about this atheistic cult of totalitarianism called communism, where they are a church and a cult themselves. 
versus the Christian church and American values on one side and man believing in God. This is not just the battle of the 20th century. This is now going into the 21st freaking century, Eric. It is not stopping. And as I've indicated, in other it's a episodes, holy war. It's a holy war. It really is a holy war. And they are here. Here's what Chambers said. And this may be appropriate to the people out there today. This, the, the communists were willing to die for their beliefs and the Christians in America were not. And he said that's why they kept infiltrating and having more success. These guys were thrown out of windows, jumped out of windows, off themselves, did all this stuff. And the American public did not understand that they were playing this game for keeps. They didn't have any idea, any idea as to the tenacity, the ideolog uh, ideology that they were they were sworn to and how serious they were even to this day about this. Henry Luce understood. That's why he kept uh, uh, Whitaker Chambers on the payroll despite everyone else at Time Magazine. They had to get rid of all the communists at Time Magazine uh, with Henry Lewis because they had been infiltrated. John Forster Dulles offered Alger Hiss, after he was convicted, a position as president of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. Okay? That's how deep this goes. That's how deep this crap goes because they're all linked to these guys. They're all together in a web, and it's hard to sever Somebody like a Henry Kissinger, and I'm, I'm using Henry Kissinger just mm. for na name recognition. Um, it's hard to sever someone that large. And, and the analogy that I've used before is LBJ in Texas. And how many people, Eric and I have discussed this, how many people like Bill Moyers and others have made their bones on the back of LBJ today? And people ask me, LBJ is dead. What are they afraid of? It's not that they're afraid. The judges who became judges, their children who are now judges, the, the lawyers. Legacy. The legacy is it's more than a legacy, though. If LBJ goes down, your job, how did your father get your right. job? Your legacy, too. All legacies are tied right. in with that. Yeah, right, right. So, I mean, you know, when, when he's outed LBJ in 1948 for stealing this election, they denied this. They denied to this day. If you look at Wikipedia <coughs> about Alger Hiss. 1996 is a 1970 British documentary in color that we can't show, but maybe we could show it on locals afterwards, mm. where they interview Alger Hiss in 1970. He denies all of this. He says it's all because of the Red Scare, McCarthyism. A lot of people got caught up uh, who were hunted like, like dogs by McCarthy, and I was one of them. I never did anything. He's a bullshit, lying sack of shit. And so is his son, Tony Hiss, to this day. Now, Tony Hiss is going around saying my father was innocent. Getting back to the original part of this episode, where I said the grandchildren of the Rosenbergs are going around. They can't have their kinfolk be exposed for the communist rats that they were because they can't live with themselves. Unless they go full radical commie and come out, that would undermine their effectiveness of infiltrating HBO, infiltrating the government, getting a job in some administration. Uh, we, we've had a number of these people trying to get appointments now in the, in the Biden administration. Famously, that Chinese woman who went to the Lenin School of, of Economics trying to become the banking uh, 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 leader of the United States. Turned out she was a shoplifter and he had to pull back the, uh, the nomination. The only thing that's the reason she was rejected was because she kept getting arrested as a shoplifter, for Christ's sakes. But this is not going away, folks. This, like I've said before, and I believe this to be true, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, like with the collapse of Nazi Germany, uh, uh, hardcore Soviets, not to, not to say they weren't here before, but I'm saying hardcore Soviets who were hardcore Soviets up until the 90s in the Soviet Union came to Beverly Hills, came to Brooklyn, came to London, came to Washington, and burrowed into our government like these guys did in 1937, 1936, which is why I'm doing this freaking episode, because the same thing is happening again. And the American people do not understand how dedicated these maniacs are. You know what's you know, truly scary about them? What? They're godless. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Keep this in mind. Yeah. They are atheists. They don't believe in an afterlife, and they're willing to die. That's what Whitaker That's Chambers very says. Scary. That's what consider. he says in his in his autobiography. He says unless he, he can, and he he 
does not want to do this. He contemplates suicide a number of times. There's numbers. Whoop, there's a number of self-deletion attempts by by Whitaker Chambers, including during the last hearings when Alger Hiss is about to be right before Hiss is indicted. He buys this uh, chemical, which is a gas in the hardware store, takes it to his mother's house, puts a hood over and opens it up uh, and wakes up the next morning. The hood had fallen off and his mother came in, saving him from uh, self-deletion because he couldn't live with himself of outing these people and not having the ability to really convince the American people as to the level of infiltration by the communists in the 50s and 40s. 30s and now into where we are now you know yeah. you know the um, what the, what their goal was what their besides infiltration and and altering us us policy which is pretty bold uh because sp there's spies on both sides there's spies on both sides and sure. we had spies over there we had spies here right that's spying right we didn't infiltrate the communist party in moscow and begin to try to alter <laughs> their system to some capitalist system we didn't do that. They did that here. And they and they rode upon the backs of liberals. That's how they were able to piggyback into these positions, getting people like FDR to appoint them to these positions. And FDR would just be laughing it off inside the White House. You know, they they told him they told him that Harry that Harry Dexter White was a communist in 1936. He laughed in their face. The Venona cable showed just how much of a communist uh, and a spy, the, the head of the Treasury Department of the United States was, that weasel right there. He laughed it off. Nobody could convince FDR that these people were communist spies. Now, was he a fellow traveler? Probably. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Was his wife a communist? She's definitely a socialist, for that matter. I mean, the, the level of infiltration of these godless people into these American government positions, uh, that's their church is the government. I'm not the first one to say this. That's their church. When somebody else takes over that uh, 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 situation, like in 2017, when someone else took over their church, they went batshit crazy. They went batshit crazy. Um, that's what they do. There was a great line, if I can find it, by, by, by uh, Chambers about how crazy they go. Uh, anyway, it, it's it's like most people who have substituted delusion for this is a quote from Chambers. Like most people who have substituted delusion for reality, they become hysterical whenever the root of their delusion is touched. Now, how, does that sound like TDS or what, Eric? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what. And he wrote that in, in 1949. I mean, wow. Wow. Well, and they also it's not just TDS, Mark. It's um. It's being woke, having yeah. no humor, right. I, I no bet, humor yeah, whatsoever. I, I, they don't I, have. I, I mean the whole gamut, right? Right. I mean the whole gamut. I, and when you tell them about it, they they flip out. They flip mm -hmm. out. Now the communists, you know, realized that people, for for the most part, had some sort of humanity to them, and they wanted Christmas. So, in 1936 in Moscow, they reluctantly created Father Frost. And and he was he was you know Santa Claus, uh, but they couldn't call him Santa Claus, uh, so they called him Father Frost. And just a little little side note there about uh, uh, how they handle Christmas over there. But yeah, I mean, look th this this situation. I mean, Hiss later says in that 1970 documentary with the BBC that anti-communism was the anti-Semitism of America. Now, how disingenuous is that? Well, they're doing that now. Right. I mean, I mean, Jonathan Greenblatt or whatever. And I, I well, mean, how, when you attack George Soros, what's the first thing they say? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, they yeah. got this from Alger Hiss. This is where they got it from, bro. And uh, well, it works. That thing they, is, they, it works. They, they wrote so many articles after he was found guilty, went to jail. 1965, 1970, 1975, The Nation, New York Times, all these per periodicals trying to uh, re re repair his uh, image and repair the damage done to him and the others. Uh, because if Hiss is a commie, what are the other people that were surrounded by Hiss? They were commies. And they have tried so many times. This is all pre-Venona. 
And now even after Venona Cables, they just go, well, you know, it's not certain that he was a commie. It's not certain that he did this. He had a nickname, a, nick, a code name named Ailes, A-L-E-S. Uh, and that's in the Venona Cables as to what his operation was. And, and, and you don't need to know that because Ailes, uh, you could tell by his job description, it's the same as where Alger Hiss is mm -hmm. in his description. So they you know, quit pretty easily. Uh, uh, are able to decipher that Ailes is Alger Hiss. But you know? they didn't say his name. Right. Well, that's the tight level of defense they're now offering. That's the level of defense, that they didn't say his actual name. Now, I mean, Hiss, you know, would just lie about every single part of this trial. And eventually they caught him on the two things. They just said, screw it. We're just going to take him down on these two. Uh, and all of that was Tom Murphy. Now, Tom Murphy... Uh, will later become a judge. He will also become the uh, head of New York City Police Department and then a judge. And um, Truman doesn't want the um, Justice Department to be involved. Does that sound familiar? Because if the Justice Department is involved, then it's on him that there are commies in his administration. So Truman denies all of the fact that, McCar you know, that, that McCarthy is going after these people and, and uh, you know, all the way up the ladder denies all of this stuff. Uh, he does issue the loyalty oath, uh, but that's almost like a saving grace to, you know, push back against the anti push back against the uh, communist and, and give something to the anti communist. Wow. Uh, and they're a gift that keeps on giving. You know, when, 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 when he was all alone at the end chambers, nobody was helping him he would get letters in the mail uh, from the American people. And he said every day he would get a letter with the 91st Psalm in it, uh, with different variations of the 91st Psalm. And um, I don't know if you uh, Christian followers out there know what the 91st Psalm is, but there's about 12 or 13 of them. But the one he kept getting was, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the mighty. I mean, that's just like a heavyweight heavyweight psalm. Another one was, he shall cover thee with feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And I mean, he needed all of this because he was going to commit suicide, uh, uh, self-deletion chambers. And he eventually gets uh, this medal from uh, Ronald Reagan posthumously um, I forget the name of the the um, Presidential Medal of Freedom. The, I think it's the highest. Yeah, civilian. Highest, highest civilian medal. Re Reagan. Not that he needed rehabilitating Chambers. Uh, Chambers is an American hero, and he went all alone with no help. Uh, he had, like I said, he had a farm in Maryland and uh, gave up. He, you know, gave up everything for this country to do this. Uh, was he a commie to begin with? Yeah. He was. And he saw the he said the evil was that they had no God that he, he just said this repeatedly. They were godless and that was their evil. And they were trying to create a godless society on Earth. Now, like you said, Eric, I mean, this is a war of the ages. I mean, this is a, this is a holy war. Yeah, well, I mean, there's that old saying about they have a God sized hole in their heart. I've but heard that. They're building the government as their god. Yeah, it, it, that's all. It's like they don't have this religion; they have that one, and that, that is I, it. Well, luckily, we're on the side of the one that has a god, as opposed to their side. But the reality of it is, the I mean, either side could blow the world to smithereens, sure. and, they're, and they're, they're so far apart. I mean, they want to take apart the nuclear family. They want to groom children. They want to have a you know transitional. Uh, transgender uh, situations. I mean, I don't know if any of these things, they're so far apart uh, in terms of, of uh, politics. I don't know if they're, if that bridge is bridgeable, Eric, any longer. Um, I keep reaching back to the 70s and yeah. the late 60s. And, you know, remember Reagan came after that. Not before. No, no, but but I'm so saying it, these it, are it, these are social issues now. These are not political issues. These are social issues. But the social's turning. I, I I think that the culture is shifting, and you're seeing backlash. 
like you've never seen before. And I'll keep saying Bud Light till I'm blue in the face, but it's it's true. That's like a, a major moment, I think, that's going to get recorded down where people finally said, what? We've had enough. And I hope, well, I hope there's right. more and more. And more. Well, it, it's you know, my favorite quotation um, of Hemingway is, you know, how did you go bankrupt? Slowly at first and then suddenly. And that's kind of how these things shift, too, is it's like slowly you see pushback here, a little pushback there, and this thing happens there. And, and then all of a sudden the tide turns and well, I, it goes I, I the other way. I certainly hope so um, because uh, they're not going to quit. That's all I can tell you. Unless we could push back and, and um, um, you know, find a way to – like to who is who is the next McCarthy is, is is an episode we'll do on McCarthyism and see where this went. I mean, Nixon was in back of him and, and Roy Cohn and some other people who the left has disparaged, which is fine. That's their game is to shout, mm -hmm. have temper tantrums and, and just, you know, make Nixon into Hitler. Bush is Hitler. Trump is Hitler. My mother is Hitler. Everybody's Hitler. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, we, we're kind of hip to their game at this point. It's almost like the boy who cried wolf. You know, you, when you scream sure. that, when you turn your amp up to 11 to open a set, there's nowhere left to go. And they're on mm -hmm. 11 all the time, Eric. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to maintain that when you say this person is a Yahtzee, this person's a Yahtzee. And you're like, well, that's just like my uncle. Uh, yeah. My uncle helped me ride, learn to ride a horse or, or, you know, whatever it is. You know, people start to recognize their family members and they're like, well, my uncle isn't this. My cousin isn't that. My, you know, this this looks like my relative and they're perfectly fine. I'm confused. Right. And it, it goes on. But Well, I strongly urge people. There's a lot of books on Alger Hiss and, and I, gee, I've been reading them all. I mean, thanks to the uh, PayPal book fund. I mean. And you could my whole wall is stacked with KGB Venona books now. And 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 this one I had to go audible on it because it was 780 pages. So I mean that took 34 hours of listening, Eric. I, no, the, a lot the, of walking. They, it's healthy. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people saying stuff where I where I just read their lips and I can't hear them talking. But uh yeah, I mean, look, the the book that is really the, the masterpiece is the uh, Whitaker Chambers book, uh, Witness. That's the, the one I'd recommend right now because um, it's a true story of, so of all Soviet spies uh, at the time and the trial that captivated the nation. Uh, we're not taught this in school. We're taught this briefly, like people pointed out about, about the Rosenbergs. Uh, we cover this in a millisecond in school about Whitaker Chambers. Uh, they still try to smear Whitaker Chambers. He's an American hero. They link him to Nixon, that they're both, you know, evil. Uh, but the reality of it is he didn't have to do what he did. And he risked his life uh, to to pull this off. But he did it for his children, too. You know, mm. and, and, and you know, he did it for his wife. Dude, it's just like so many crazy stories. On the way to the trial in, in Maryland, as he's supposed to go to the trial, his wife's coming home from the store and she runs over an old lady and kills her. And gets arrested. The Baltimore State Troopers come to their house in Maryland and take them to the police station. Uh, she's cleared, you know, pretty quickly because the woman came out from behind a parked car and okay. she ran over and killed her. But she was so devastated by this. I sure. mean, this, they, they, their families had so much tragedy, both families, his and chambers of, of different, um, which I won't get into. Uh, details of self-deletion and other things, alcoholism and everything else. But um, it's just a, an amazing, amazing book that I really recommend that people, if you have the time, I know Pasha has the time, obviously read it in two sittings. Um, so there are people out there who are reading these types of books. And I don't mean them to read these books just for the sake of reading a Civil War book or something. The reason you have to read it today is because you have to learn what's going on now. It's the descendants of the same people. That's why you have to study Whitaker Chambers. That's why you have to study Alger Hiss. You have to know how they play the game before you could fight back. Uh, they are not going to take out an ad in the New York Times and explain their game plan to you. They're going to burrow in to these different government organizations, and they already have. 
They already have. I mean, remember the guy who who was the guy with the mustache and the dress who was stealing luggage, who was in charge of nuclear uh, waste? I forgot. I forgot right. its name. Right. Blink. I don't know. I forget his name. But the reality of it is they and, and Chambers talks about this. They don't care what expertise you have for that particular job. In fact, the communists would prefer that you didn't have any expertise in the job that you have somehow gotten, because that's a distraction. In other words, if you could get a job in Treasury, you get a job in the Agriculture Department, you get a job in nuclear waste management, it doesn't matter uh, what your expertise is. It's about getting that job and moving up the ladder in the government. And we'll get into Henry Wallace in another episode because Henry Wallace was their boy who was going to become the communist president of the United States. By the way, that's a that's a byproduct of communism in of itself and one of its weaknesses that caused it to implode. What you just said, they don't care about you having skills with a job. It's right. exa It was exactly that way traditionally in the Soviet Union where you are assigned a job. Mark, you're a mechanic. Congratulations. Right. You no, know, no, God, no. I'm absolutely. I'm mechanically adept. I don't like it. You know? Right. But that's yeah. why they had Harry Dexter White from our uh, Treasury Department helping their economic uh, 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 situation in the Soviet Union because they didn't know how to run their own economics. Mm -hmm. So we had our uh, uh, guys who graduated from economic schools here helping them. And that picture that I kept putting up with them, you know, that was with them, right? I can't see. It's a little small for me. Well, I don't have it right now, but Keynes. John oh, yeah, Maynard yeah, Keynes. yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. the great FDR um, economist that everyone likes to quote. But speaking of economy, we have some uh, support coming in. What? Got a super sticker here from John S. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And John S. also wants to know, does Mark believe that Nixon was right all along about the Hiss, about Hiss, the Rosenbergs, as all my life I've been taught Nixon used them for political advantage? It's both. He was right and he used them for political advantage. I, mean, I know that's hard to, to swallow, but he was right about them and he moved up the political ladder. He used what he had. He, he worked hard for it. It wasn't like he created these people. He was the only one who believed them. He was the only one who disbelieved the Rosenbergs. He deserved to get promoted up the political ladder. You know what I mean? It's, you know, it's like people going, oh, he, he, he did this, you know, for political purposes. Yeah, he's a politician. What is he supposed to do? True, true. I mean, I don't know if we're ever going to do an episode on Nixon. I know he's covered a lot, but definitely misunderstood. Ah, your tasty drink of the day. <laughs> Well, here's some um, orange to go back at you. Speaking of witness, do you believe John McAfee self-deleted or perhaps in the witness protection program? I think he knows where Hoff is buried. LOL. Thank you both. Well, my opinion, I know Eric has his opinion. My opinion is they got his uh, crypto code out of him and then killed him. Uh, and I believe there's a guy uh, in Argentina they just did it to. Uh, they got his crypto code. They tortured him. This is a minor john mccaffrey uh, mccaffrey of argentina uh who was living high and they did the same thing to him i believe this is just my opinion the thing with mcafee is i can argue it three different ways all okay. right well we, we don't have to, you don't have to argue with yourself right now but what, no what i'm is, just saying he, he could be alive he could be dead oh he no, could have no, done no himself I, yeah. or the other well no, you know what they've okay. never released a body I know. Uh, I release know. a body and it'll go a long way to convincing me. You're you know, probably right. You're other. probably right. You're probably right. So, okay. All right. I, I'm going to say he's up in the air. Um, comment. As a freshman at the University of Texas in 1981, I saw Alger Hiss speak. During Q&A, a plant asked him if he had ever been a communist. Hiss dramatically declared and had never been a communist. He was clearly lying. Right. I mean, the lies that Alger Hiss tells are so big. And so enormous, and 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 Chambers at the end of his book, as have others, other journalists said, and I I was just reading one by uh, George Will, who wrote a long piece about him, saying the the fact that he would never admit even being a communist when it was, was so many others were, and it's so clear that he was, it, 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 he's some people believe he was delusional, that he was just a psychopath. Wow. Hey, I got a rumble rant in here from iCare22. Mark, you are over the target. My dad passed away in 1999, 88 years young. Spoke exactly about this. Didn't understand. Now I do. Bravo to your dad. And uh, 
Church fart on locals sent in a tip saying, question, can you name one federal agency that has not already been overtaken by the Marxist slash communist? I don't know. I'd have to look at every, there's hundreds and hundreds of federal agencies. I, I don't really know. Uh, infiltrated, taken over. Yeah, I mean, like it, uh, infiltrated, I'm sure just about all of them. Taken right. over? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know about that. But at the very end, when the reporters were, were, were surrounding mm -hmm. his house, um, and they were just inundating him with press. You know, uh, one of the reporters said to uh, Chambers, uh, "What do you, what do you think you're doing?" Just like that, he just said, "What do you think you're doing? What is this?" And and without skipping a beat, uh, Chambers famously said, "I am a man who reluctantly, grudgingly, is destroying himself that this country and the faith by which it lives may continue to exist." He said wow. that off the top of his freaking head, Eric, to the reporters who recorded it at that time in his house and the farm in Maryland. Think about that. I mean, he knew and wrote about in this book that he was destroying his entire life, but he couldn't live with himself as an American. And that's why Whitaker Chambers needs a, a national holiday. He needs a postage stamp. He needs a, a statue in the middle of Maryland. And I think his, his kids... Uh, prevented a statue from being built or something because it was a Quaker, uh, a, a Quaker thing. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 It was about the Quaker uh, uh, not worshiping idols, I think. No, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. We, you, yeah. We've discussed that before that the strongest people are those who switch sides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. And that's why the Soviets wanted to kill him so badly. I mean, they made numerous attempts on his life trying to get to him. Um, they did not want him to go to prison because they felt if um, he went to prison, he'd be a martyr, Eric. They wanted to set up one of those phony self-deletions that they had done to his uh, peers. Oh, yeah. That, that was their goal. I believe it. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Evil, $814, $50. Thank you. Keep up the good work. He's a good doctor. Very good doctor. Thank you. <laughs> might my, be I, evil, I, I, but he's no, good. But, he's getting uh, better. He's, get, he's I, becoming good. That's my proctologist, by the way. Oh, hope he's not using the tool in his hand in that picture. Um, anyway, Pasha, thanks for your attempts at obfuscating all those bad words that YouTube keys on. But how long until the uh, YouTube AI starts to get wise to that kind of thing? I'm sure it is, but we yeah. just have to keep going. They keep moving the goalposts. We keep chasing the ball. It's sort of like Charlie Brown and Lucy, you know? Yeah, he's right. He's right. Um, Lynn Blechstein, with me so emotionally, most of my father's relatives died under the communists through execution hmm. and starvation. Right. Those that survived that were sent to the gulag camps, never to be heard from again. So, well, so, Solzhenitsyn gets out, and I compare this book to Solzhenitsyn's work. Um, very similar tone, very similar themes, very similar theology. Um, Gulag Archipelago and, and, and Witness are, are bookends about the communists. And uh, do not take this lightly. Do not go to bed without thinking about this. This is um, something that's not going to go away, folks. You know, unless we begin to have a purge, and I'm not talking about a Stalin-esque purge, I mean a purge of Marxists from the yeah. United States government, a urge of communist because their desire is a world communist uh, uh, planet of all their crazy socialist ideas. They're not going to play nice. They're not going to say, OK, I'm done. They're not going to cooperate. They're going to lie. The reason the lying is so important with Al Jahiz is it shows you that, that lying is part of the Marxist game plan. True. They have no morality. They have no overlord or anything above them to keep them on the straight and narrow. Uh, in other words, they fate, they have no uh, morality other than themselves. And the morality of, yeah, that's hard. There's no to, Ten Commandments. There's no commandments. <laughs> that's what Ten. I think. Well, whatever. It was, it's, yes, it's it, there's no golden rule. They don't care. They have an objective. Right. They are they, the Borg. Yep, yep. <laughs> and ly lying is meaningless to them. So they, you know, yeah. they are expert. I mean, when you watch Alger Hiss's performance, and I've looked at a lot of video of Alger Hiss, he is such, an, and he's obviously a top attorney. So that goes with it, you know, how smooth he's lying. But I mean, the level of lying when confronted with bank statements and, 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 and he, there was a, okay. So 
Alger Hiss and his wife were ornithologists, right, by hobby. And there was some bird, I can't even pronounce the name, in Baltimore uh, that they went out and found. Who did they find it with? With the hisses. They went out driving one day, and the hisses, I mean, the hisses were with the chambers, and they saw this particular bird. You can barely pronounce this bird's name. Whitaker Chambers says this story uh, about this bird, and, and, and Hiss denies it. And Hiss had written about this bird. I mean, it's just, he's trapped in so many lies that you just go, bro, I, I mean, you got to be kidding me. But he never buckles to the day he dies. Till the, the Venona cables come out in 94, 95, 96. He dies in 96. And he had written to the Soviets. He had a friend over there and he saw this coming. And he asked his friend in writing, I need these files to prove my innocence. A Soviet guy. And he says, uh, bad news. And he goes, what? He goes, you're all through here, bro. <laughs> he says, what? He says, yeah, your name's all through the files. You're toast. And he goes, all right, all right okay, all right. Never mind. Wow. <clears throat> all right, um, Rio AI or AL McCoy. This is fantastic. Mark is on an epiphany role with this topic, appreciation, respect. Good. There's more of it to come. Yeah, there's more of it to come because it's such an important topic. I know you people are into JFK and it's the anniversary, but there's other fish to fry that's going on right now with the election coming up this year. And this, uh, uh, well, this overlaps. It, there, there's some tentacles that tie in. It overlaps, but this is uh, more important right now, people. I can tell you that. You know, the rest is the other part's history, but this is really important. Let me see. I don't care how long this takes. I love the music. Uh, what music? At the I don't beginning know, of the intro, uh, I'm gonna keep playing it. I don't know. Is there music in the background or something? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, AUS on Mad Magazine. Oh. That's relevant. That's relevant. Yeah, I guess. Uh, uh, also, when is the DOJ going to bring Mothman to justice once and for all? Or are they oh, all? In oh, on this it? is a funny guy. Okay. I see. Okay, I get it. We're talking about life or death situations, but Hawking is obsessed with Mad Magazine and Mothman. Well. I mean, Mad Magazine was meaningless to me, except for the fold out in the back at Spy versus Spy. Ironically, those two things I really liked in Mad. Uh, the rest of it was for 10 year olds. I mean, it really was. So, and then what was the other part of the, the Mothman? We, well, we talked about that before. Yeah. Um, Al Gonzalez, uh, Mark, the $6 billion Biden just gave to Iran is a payment to take out Trump, in my opinion. Your take? I put my take on Twitter yesterday. My take is that traditionally, uh, you exchange spies for spies. These are CIA operatives uh, mm -hmm. who are caught in Iran as part of their job. They know the deal. They're usually exchanged uh, for people that we have. We have never given this level of money to a foreign enemy power uh, in American history. Just well, to we answer close. That. Obama gave a few hundred million to them too. So. No, no, I'm yeah, talking about to get, to get CIA operatives out of, ca out of captivity. This is traditionally done with a prisoner or or intelligence operative exchange, Eric, as you're well like aware. Like we did with Briner. Uh, uh, a a million times. Uh, this yeah. goes back to America, all through American history. No sure. president has ever bought their release. No president has ever paid for their release. Uh, uh, you know, saying here's here's an extra couple of billion. By the way, right? I, I would say that this is more of a a payment than it is a uh, well. But exchange. we do get the release of these CIA agents. We do get sure. their release. So it's not just it's it's an opportunistic payment, mm -hmm. I believe. Instead of giving them, uh, okay, who did we trade for Griner? Didn't we trade an arms dealer for Griner? Yeah, the the uh, weapons merchant, the right, the, top the guy in the world. That's right. Okay, so more Griner, the war. That's right. So Griner got traded straight up in a in a with a player to be named later. She was a forward or a center in the WNBA. I don't know what this guy played, but he got back and he was with Putin and he said, thanks a lot for getting me out. We didn't give Putin six billion fucking no. dollars to get. I know. Let me just finish. We didn't give Putin six billion dollars to get Griner. Right. Mm -hmm. Why are we giving the Mullahs six billion dollars to get a couple of CIA operatives when we could clearly trade some of their spies that we have somewhere that we've captured? That's how that's my take on the whole thing. Yeah, obviously, because we wanted to give them a few billion dollars. <laughs> and then this is cover. It's a cover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me say, Carl uh, Burkhalter, Marxism in the U.S. began with German immigrants in 1854. 
They were in the War Department and in the Civil War. The Communist Manifesto was published in 1848. And that's what I say. Yeah, right, right. right. No, no, no. That's all true. That's all true. But I'm talking about the level of, of, of how many communists, because of the Depression in 1929, this begins to, to uh, mushroom in the United States sure. way past what the time period this guy's talking about, 1848. No, I know, but it was it was culminating because the anarchists were tied in with it prior to that with McKinley and everything. And Right. Well, the anarchists were not communists. I, I am talking about the Soviet post-1917 revolution Soviets infiltrating mm -hmm. the United States. I mean, he is branded, by the way, Chambers is branded uh, part of the reasons of the death that they were calling back people to the Soviet Union, and they were luring them back with prizes, cash, and, and tributes, and then they were purged and executed. So people were hip to this. And, and the way they did it was so slick in some of these different things. We're going to appoint you the head of the Olympic Committee, just any way to get you back, and then purge trial, and you're dead. Okay, so they tried that with Chambers. He didn't bite, and uh, they wanted him to come back and do that. And he realized that he was going to be um, uh, offed. Then they came at him saying he was a Trotskyite and an enemy of the state. And everyone who was declared a Trotskyite had to be executed as part of the uh, rules of engagement, I guess. Sure. All right. Dustin had to take the kids through the car wash to get the bass done in time for the show. That's Five funny. Episode. He doesn't care if the car gets wet. See, that's why I like Russell. He he would rather take care of his children and their hygiene than care about the inside of his 1959 Studebaker, which he Correct. drives, which is in mint condition. That Studebaker convertible, um, uh, not convertible, uh, uh, um, station wagon. Uh, he doesn't care that it's filled with water, Russell. And I love that about him. The kids are clean. Let's go. That's right. Dedication. Dedication. All right. We got two more tips on locals. Alehouse 20. Having family in Poland liquidated by the Ukrainian slash Soviets. Rather mm -hmm. sad to have simply absorbed the nation, et cetera, with my super awesome IV education. Thank you for the pithy correction and great storytelling. Oh, OK. What, what correction? The, um... uh, the Ivy League. I mean, come on, dude. This I was practically trained to be a socialist as a kid and I didn't go to Ivy league. That was in a, just an upper level Tucson high school, but yeah. Oh, been... oh, but what's the correction? He, did we correct him or something or he's just saying, I think a correction on the history. Oh, you know, okay. And, oh, all right. Okay. I'm sure cool. you heard the Alger Hiss got a bum rap. Uh, right. Well, they both were Ivy league, by the way, uh, Harvard <laughs> and Columbia. So oh, yeah, they, yeah. Both, they both came out of Ivy league schools. All right, and last tip is the socialist push is also a cover for corruption. Look at the Bidens and Pelosi's. Right, but they're they're not ideologues, bro. Those are corrupt cats that they always back mm. because then they have an Achilles heel to take them down. But he doesn't believe in anything, Joe Biden. Nancy no. Pelosi does not believe in anything. Mitch McConnell does not believe in anything. These are cats that they prop up who they know are corrupt, who, who they know are fallible, so they could take them down with a couple of phone calls. That's why they push these guys along the train, to get them into positions of power. And the Chinese are doing the same thing right now uh, that, that Stalin did. It's, it's the same playbook. So uh, we've got a two-front Cold War going on with these guys on both sides of the... Uh, not, not that they're in the Soviet Union anymore. They're here. Uh, it's not Russia that's doing it. It's the Soviets internally. No, true. Um, Ennis Fad, how does this coincide with the public slash private partnership of government slash corporation? Isn't this more like fascism? No, I don't think it's like fascism at all. The, uh, the well, government fascism is technically socialism, but anyway, it, it's it gets into that. Um, the the point is, you have a lot of players that are trying to take over the world, and they're using whatever means they can. Communism mm -hmm. is one of the tricks. We need a board game. Is we, need, we need a world economic forum board game. That would be a good idea. I know. I know. Take over the world by the end of the game. Uh, yeah. Um, Michael DePaul, I read in James Perloff's book, Shadows of Power, that Truman and George C. Marshall sold out the nationalist Chinese to the Chai comms. That's Did true. Hiss have any influence on this? Yeah, I mean, Hiss was blamed partially for the loss of China as one of the advisors in the State Department. Uh, Hiss said he was, you know, that he didn't have any any responsibility for that. But Hiss was uh, blamed 
uh, as part of that group for losing China, so to speak. What a coincidence that the guy who got him convicted is the one who opened up relations with China. Uh, also, uh, I just want to say one of the great songs of all time was written about the uh, Harry Truman campaign in 1948. I'm just wild about Harry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> That's from his campaign, by the way. All right. Well, Oswald salutes your musical taste. And okay. All right. <laughs> we are caught up on Super Chats. Friday is going to be Free Phone Friday. Yeah, we'll cover these stories that you were talking about. We'll cover the Russell Brand oh, thing and, and some of the other stories you're talking about there. Yeah, it, it there seems to be plenty going on this week. We'll have plenty to chat about on Friday. Right. So, if yeah. anybody could find a picture of Father Frost, I'd really appreciate it. Is they it's like they're Chris Kringle or or they're Santa Claus, but I've never seen a photo of them. I'm curious to see how close it is to um, uh, Santa Claus. Good question. Homework for Friday. <laughs> see everybody then. Bye bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.